So, Laurie, I was wondering, I, I, have you taken, I thought you were in architecture class, um, but I, I was mistaken, I think, about that. Uh, have, have, what course have you taken with me? So I did, I, I tried architecture several times. Um, really? Yeah, so first time I think was, it was freshman year. I don't remember if it was fall or spring. I'd have to go back and look. Um, but I, I took way too many credits. You know, I was one of those yeah, first gen yeah. kids that I looked at my schedule and I'm like, well, I should take more classes because there's a lot of open room. And I think uh, Dean Barr stopped me at 18 credits coming in. <laughs> um, yeah. And so I think it may, it might've actually been spring then. Um, but I always, I started in architecture and I think I did it twice where I ended up withdrawing because it ended up being in those mm -hmm. semesters mm -hmm. where I was really overloaded. And I actually, um, you know, your the TED talk that you gave on baskets and I had shared it with Dan um, and I went back and found my old architecture notes and I actually just scanned them and gave them to him because I have uh, drawings of the Hagia Sophia and a couple other buildings mm -hmm. in my so, notes. So finally, you did take the course. But I, I withdrew, though. I, I think I took it for like the first oh i see month. i see okay because yeah. i have this image of you with your friend with annette i think you said uh, yes of course um so yeah well that and then i took art in gallery with you uh, um and i think painting then my senior year maybe mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah we'll talk more about this before we finish today <laughs> okay okay yeah I, I suspect this much. Uh, <laughs> Good afternoon and welcome to broadcast the webinar interview series from the University of Nebraska Lincoln Center for Academic Success and Transition. I'm Dan Hutt, and we are delighted to have with us here today from New York, artist, art historian, and educator, Serdar Arat. Serdar, it's a real honor to have you with us here today. Well, Dan, it's, uh, it's a great pleasure for me. So hello to you, to Lori, and our audience out there uh, today. All right, we'll, we'll jump right in. Serdar, I know that you were born in Ankara, Turkey, and you went to college in Istanbul. Did you always know you, you would go to college? Yes, I did. Uh, you know, education was big for my family, but also nationwide, uh, you would be educated and then, you know, do good for your mm -hmm. country. There was that kind of nation building uh, going on. So, yes. And I understand that you attained a, a degree in business as an undergrad. Is that is that correct? That's correct. And and I'm glad you didn't say study business. I <laughs> uh, barely graduated uh, with a, with a business degree. It wasn't a major that I chose. Really, I chose a campus. Mm -hmm. I chose a university. But uh, that's right. I, I I went to business school for my undergrad. And how would you describe your undergraduate experience? Oh, first two years and last two years, like night and day. First two years uh, was like sleepwalking, really. I had no real connection to business. And I was a boarding, uh, I'm sorry, a, a commuter. So in Istanbul, it was like four hours a day on the road. Wow. Uh, so that was that was really devastating. Uh, and then the last two years, I was in heaven. I mean, I was still uh, a commuter, but I was constantly crashing in rooms, various rooms in the dorms uh, with my friends. And it wasn't it was the same curriculum. It wasn't the courses, but the activities. Uh, my friends Dear friends, uh, they pulled me into uh, music and drama uh, clubs, kicking and screaming. You know, I, I didn't want to. I resisted. But they, because they needed people, you know, desperately or something. And that changed my entire uh, life, actually. Not just college life, but really uh, my life uh, period. 
And, and you know, one more, perhaps the most important part of it is that during those activities, two music clubs and, and the theater club, uh, it was the intensity and the professionalism, the passionate commitment of these kids, you know, my peers and, and friends, you know, doing it at a very high level uh, that I got a taste of, uh, oh, so this is what creative life, creative process is, is about. Uh, so it was an informal art education, I think, even though I didn't take a single art course uh, as an undergrad. And I understand there's a, you had somewhat of an epiphany specifically, an experience that led you to formally make that transition to art. Is that, is that so? Uh, it is that sudden epiphany, I believe, <laughs> uh, took about 25 years okay. uh, to, to uh, come to fruition. I, you know, uh, people know, we all know, students who are, who are watching, uh, they would agree with this, I think. Somewhere in the back of your mind, uh, you know, you know, where you want to go or what interests you or what your strengths uh, might be. Uh, so I think in the back of my mind in that safe space, uh, completely private and protected, I was nurturing art, I was making art, um, but it was uh, totally for me. Nobody knew about it, or so I thought. Uh, when it was time for college, though, my parents really surprised me. They set me down, which is something that they never did before. And they said, look, if you wanna go to art school, we'll support you, we're okay with it. But I could almost feel that they were <laughs> keeping their fingers behind that I would say no. And I said, what, art school, you know, where'd that come from? Uh, I rejected it. And then I went to my room and thought, you know, how did they know? Here I am, I didn't have the guts to admit it even to myself, a life in art, you know, I uh, couldn't even imagine it, uh, it was too good. Uh, and yet they knew. So yeah, so uh, some years later, I surprised them, uh, everybody actually, by uh, just giving it all up and coming to the US for, for art. Uh, myself included, by the way, I had no plans, uh, no um, uh, thoughts of going abroad uh, initially. That's really extraordinary. It usually happens the, the reverse that, uh, students are the ones that, that are convincing their parents that, to let them go to art school. Right. And for you, it was, the, it was the reverse in that sense. Well, I, uh, like I, I said, you know, uh, there is that big you know, challenge. How do you make a living, right? Right, right. Uh, uh, so uh, as every student out there, if, every young person uh, is facing that question. I was facing it too. Uh, and in Turkey at that time, in the 70s, 80s, it was more difficult to, to do that. Uh, plus, I mean, how do I know I'm good as an artist? You know, if I chose it as my life, uh, how would I ever know if I'm good or bad? Or how does, you know, how does one make a career or life in art? I did not have, I know my parents would have supported me. Uh, but I did not have the kind of environment in which I could have had examples, uh, guidance, you know, career or life guidance. Um, it was a different kind of time. I also, uh, I don't know if this was an excuse, but I thought the art academy in Turkey at that time was a more conservative institution that if I went there, it would be, well, it would be school you know, quote unquote school in, in a more restrictive sense, not in a, you know, mind opening sense. Uh, or maybe it was just me not having the guts or having figured out how to, uh, to make it all happen. So that's was, why I, I chose to, you know, went to business. Was there a sense anywhere in there that uh, my art is mine, something that no one else has a piece of? And if I go to the conservatory, it's not going to be mine anymore? Was that part of your thinking absolutely that's a very good point and uh i you know i haven't taken before graduate study in this country right before making that leap i hadn't taken a single art course 
not even an art appreciation or a basic drawing course. Uh, my cockiness or, or maybe protectiveness was that, yeah, I mean, art, you either got something with which you can make a, you know, uh, an artist of you or, or you don't. You know, it's not, I thought, it's not the kind of thing you can learn um, how to make. Uh, I thought, okay, maybe I can learn some skills, et cetera, but how to make art, what to make, that's very private and I had to protect it and, and uh, mm -hmm. it was very personal. For me, art was, and it's different from artist to artist, but for me, art was coming from a very private, very personal place. I thought that's where it had to come. I uh, think that's right. Yeah, I recognize that, and I, I, I'm a music person, but I, I, mm -hmm. I recognize in there, I think, uh, to some sort of a resistance to right. making rules out of what you're doing for, for art. To this day, I still uh, refuse to uh, write down the names of chords when I write a song. Right. It drives my bandmates crazy. <laughs> but that kind of resistance right. to right. somebody trying to systematize what you're doing, right. I think. You're supposed to be a troublemaker like that, aren't you, when you're an artist? Well, you know, uh, I was a well-behaved boy, uh, <laughs> uh, so I didn't, I didn't think that way, even though, you know, in, inside your mind, yeah, there are things that are just, you know, exploding and, and want to uh, fight against all the systems and all the rules that are there that you had nothing to do with, you know. Yeah. Right, right. I want to. I want to talk more about this. I've. I've always. <laughs> I, I've. I've taught for a number of years, and I've. And I have art students from time to time, or uh, not just uh, people that are in the art department, but theater students, right. uh, uh, other other fine arts, and <laughs> I've always admired them for, and I mean this affectionately, their beautiful weirdness. <laughs> and just free, free thinking and commitment to their craft and willing willingness to just head on confront that practical and conventional thinking that you're led to embrace growing up. And, and they and they defy that by majoring in art. I asked a, a former broadcast guest, uh, musician Jake Slichter, who teaches just down the road from you at Sarah Lawrence now. He's a oh. writer as well. But I he was a music major in college. And I said, Jake, where does that uh, willingness of art students to, to defy convention mm -hmm. come from? I've always suspected that it comes from a supreme confidence in your chops. And he said, no, it it, it doesn't that doesn't necessarily have to be it for me. It was fear or terror of the alternative of the cutthroat business world. Uh, what, what, what do you think about that? Where does that courage of art students to go that route come from? Absolutely. I, I mean, th that's such an important point. And I, I wanted to talk about courage uh, and self-confidence. See, uh, first, uh, when I said I chose a campus, a university, not a major really, business was sort of incidental. Um, it was because all my, you know, bright, creative, and crazy, wacky, good, crazy, and wacky friends and mm -hmm. were going to. All the interesting know. people. Yeah, yeah, all the interesting people. They were going to that campus, and I just wanted to be there. And That's then, a great reason. Yeah, I think that was that turned out to be a great reason. Uh, in terms of self confidence, I'll give you uh, an example. Two events within two months of each other. Two months before we came to the US with my wife, uh, and, and I made that leap from business to art, I had a job interview at a major bank in Turkey and it went very well. Uh, and after the interview, this old timer sort of pulled me aside and said, okay, you have nothing to worry about. It's great, you'll start in two months time. He said, uh, that'll give you some time to relax, you know, rest and regain your self-confidence. Wow, I thought they could tell. I mean, is it that obvious that, uh, and um, now two months after that, uh, you know, I gave up that job and, and you know, we're in the US, I'm, I'm an artist. It's a point of no return. I mean that, and I'm home. Uh, so the first week we were in Binghamton, New York. That's where my wife was doing her PhD. 
So I finally went to the art department to find somebody. This is going to be my first uh, ever contact for art uh, to talk to someone about you know, what I can do. I walked into the art department and Angelo Ippolito, that great artist, that saintly man, he was teaching uh, between the art studio and his office, you know, in the hallway going back and forth. So I said, hello, I told him who I am, what I want to do, et cetera. He was very warm and he immediately, you know, wanted to help. So he said, uh, let me see your portfolio. Well, I don't really have a portfolio. Well, come take courses. Uh, well, I can't because I don't have students. So, I mean, every question, every uh, possibility he offered, my answer was no, I don't have money, I don't have a student visa, I don't have work permits, no artist, I mean, nothing. Yet, uh, he kept telling me how impressed he was. Uh, and then he did take me on as his, as his project. I mean, in about a year's time, he put me into an MFA program in, in SUNY Albany. But so what was that, that you know, convinced him? Uh, he kept telling me that I was so confident, I was, I was so, you know, uh, I had so much belief in myself, et cetera. You know, how does self-confidence go from zero to a hundred, right, in two months time? And I've been thinking a lot about it. Uh, it's probably the fact that uh, I was, I had no doubt at that point. No self-doubt. This is what I'm going to do. This is a point of no risk, and I would never go back. You know, once I made the leap, I'm not going to go back to uh, a different kind of life. And you know, when doubt goes away, I think fear, what's scary, also goes away. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just you know, what's scary now just becomes ju you know hard work, right? It's hard work, very hard work, but you know, you don't mind doing that. So. Yeah, definitely. And that self-confidence is extremely important. First of all, you can't fake it. I, I found that you know, it shows. And uh, likewise, I think I would have been I would have been ripped to shreds in the business, mm -hmm. world, in the banking world. I mean, that there's no question about that. So, yeah, self-confidence and how to get there uh, has a lot to do with feeling uh at home you know with what what we need to do uh that's an extraordinary account and i'm i'm apt to uh to believe your artist mentor that sees self-confidence as opposed to the banker that sees a void of self-confidence uh in there you'll be you'll be pleased to know that uh your student lori has that same uh, tenacity and not giving up on students that uh, right. that your mentor had as well. Right. I'm sure you're not surprised to hear. Uh, uh, <clears throat> Serdar, students here at the University of Nebraska know when they matriculate, know coming in that they're going to take classes outside of their disciplines, outside their majors. And we spend a lot of time discussing how that liberal arts foundation makes one a more well-rounded person i know that you share that sort of renaissance perspective uh, in part from an excellent welcome address that i read of yours that you gave at concordia college in bronxville but also some from from the lectures of yours that i've attended in your art lectures you, you your scholarly and educational approach really crosses cultures time periods you bring in history philosophy literature architecture in connection to the art in question and in your own artwork uh takes place in a variety of mediums that perspective that renaissance perspective is a big component of both your teaching and your own art wouldn't you say well it certainly is um and it is about um connections i mean it's mm -hmm. it's you know the core curriculum, so to speak, uh, in colleges and universities, and the fact that we are all, you are uh, all encouraging students to take the core curriculum, to sort of spread curriculum-wise, discipline-wise, sort of laterally, horizontally, and, and get a you know, base knowledge. Well, the, the point of doing that is to arrive at a point, right, get enough uh, of a basic understanding 
right, of different aspects of life, so that uh, you know one can begin to see the connectedness of everything. Everything, I mean, everything in the universe, in the, in the cosmos, is related, connected. All we're doing is bit by bit discovering those little connections, right? So once we uh, find that out, the connectedness, then we can intentionally, you know, make those uh, connections evident and we can work with them and, and so on. So that I think is the purpose of what's called liberal arts, mm -hmm. uh, sort of a well-rounded person or I would right. say educated person, right? So um, that then becomes, you know, natural. Uh, and it is it is key to everything we do, uh, obviously. And, and and there are two, you know, when you're in college, there is certainly the uh, structured curriculum. There are courses that you take, but then there there is the campus life. There are mm -hmm. activities that you know. For me, it wasn't the curriculum that really did that for me. Uh, but it was the activities and then the, the trips and then the personal, uh, you know, relationships and so forth that, uh, that made it happen uh, for me. I mean, you know, if, if we think about um, all the, you know, bright, creative, successful people who have never went to college uh, or dropped out of college. So that kind of education, the liberal arts, um, you know, can either happen formally in college, you know, university settings, or one may be able to do it. It's harder, but one can do it on, on their own, you know, mm -hmm. travel, read, listen, you know, be curious, etc. cetera. Um, so it can, it can be done in, uh, in both ways, I think. Sure. Do you, do you happen to recall some of the courses that you took in college outside of your major that were particularly impactful? Uh, not really. I know I took the core curriculum, which mm -hmm. was outside of uh, the business courses. So mm -hmm. I do remember though, uh, the first year uh, being uh, really wonderful in terms of these intro courses, you know, intro psychology, intro statistics, intro economics, all of those things. All of a sudden, you can you know pick up the paper. Those days, we did pick up the paper, you know, uh, paper, paper, and mm -hmm. uh, make sense out of the headlines and the news and you know all of that. Uh, so that was good. But other than that, um, I I did not have uh, see the offerings were there. We were required to take them. But you know when you're required and when it's not put into the kind of context. Uh, you may be missing them as, as I missed the point of, you know, why, why am I taking these courses uh, kind of thing. And I remember a writing course that I had to take. Uh, I took that course and decided mm, I'm a bad writer. <laughs> and maybe I can come back to that. But, you know, we were, uh, we mentioned that earlier, uh, just before we started. Uh, there's more there. Uh, but so, yeah, the, the core curriculum, the, the courses that I could have taken in college uh, sort of slipped by me because I wasn't aware of why I was, you know, taking them or why I could take more, more uh, of those. Well, we talk about that a lot. You just hadn't discovered your why, so to speak. Uh, at, at that structure. Right. And, and it's a constant struggle, I think, today in higher ed. We talk about it, how students are more and more specialized in college. They're asked to declare a major yesterday. They're more interested in higher H-I-R-E education right. than H-I-G-H-E-R, higher ed. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I, they, they don't always appreciate those classes that they deem right. impractical in their Schedule and I think some of that's understandable, right? That times are tough economically. Uh, universities are portrayed more and more as a business. But yeah. I love how you say in, in the welcome address from Concordia, uh, "My degrees got me jobs, but my total college experience got me my life." College is supposed to be more than just job training, isn't it? 
Uh, that's a huge, big question, and and I I'd like to first uh, touch upon what you you know mentioned mm -hmm. the difficulty, just the financial difficulty of uh, getting a college education today, and graduating as an undergraduate with a debt in most cases. Uh, there is no other way to put it but um, to say that it's a crime against mm -hmm. the youth. Uh, no one should have to struggle financially to get an education, right? And, and if one is struggling to pay uh, tuition, then one is probably also struggling to make ends meet in other ways, you know, mm -hmm. uh, housing, healthcare, and, and so forth. So that is, I mean, I have great empathy uh, for students who are, who are going through uh, the financial challenges. But that said, um, once you're in college, right, and you found a way to somehow uh, afford it, uh, then I think, yes, then uh, we have to get this broad-based uh, multidisciplinary education. Uh, first of all, even from the jobs perspective, right, uh, and in that, that address you mentioned, that was one of the points that I tried to make. It was like seven minutes. I had a seven minute window to make that point. <laughs> and any job today will require multiple careers from us, not just multiple skills, but multiple careers at any given job you're going to have to have communication skills, writing skills, speaking, you know, social skills, technical skills, and I mean, you, you name it. Not to mention that jobs go away. Uh, so your overall education, right, capabilities should have prepared you for, well, to switch from this job to that job from this career to that career. It it's all about transition, yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. So, uh, but there is, you know, now coming to the bigger issue of liberal arts, right? And of, of education. Uh, you said well-rounded person, for instance. Uh, that's, you know, the old, old fashioned expression for it is educated person. I mean, mm -hmm. what is an educated person? Right, a good citizen of uh, of the world, as a matter of fact, right? And I, uh, every time I hear the phrase "liberal arts education," I cringe. Uh, I want to say there is no such thing as liberal arts education. There's education, period. Every time we say liberal arts education, we, I think, are not only being redundant, but I think we are also contributing to a kind of misinformation. Uh, inadvertently, although there is a constituency out there doing it uh, consciously, I think, those who want to sort of abolish or get rid of the liberal arts, um, because, uh, you know, liberal arts is not a type of education in my mind. It's not mm -hmm. a category. It's not a qualifier of education. So when we say liberal arts education, we inadvertently suggest that, well, if there's this kind of education, then there must be other kinds of education, which opens the door to, well, let's get rid of the liberal arts. It's too expensive. Yeah. It's not uh, practical. But liberal arts is simply what education looks like. I mean, we all know uh, great, you know, doctors, great um, IT people, great social workers, great, you know, engineers who may not be, or at least who strike us when we, you know, uh, are, you know, in, you know, exchanging, uh, you know, professional exchanges or, or social exchanges who may not strike us as really well-educated people. Mm -hmm. We know doctors who can't communicate with us, for instance. We know, you know, uh, engineers who have no sense of empathy or, or whatever, you know. Um, so I think it's very important to uh, admit 
uh, that if we're in the business of education, you know, as educators or uh, as students, then we need the liberal arts. It's not an alternative, it is um, education, you know. Uh, and so finally, since you mentioned the neuroeconomics, you know, uh, uh, it was just like uh, my way of finding a catchy uh, term to summarize the connectedness of, of everything. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, and, uh, you know, year, some years ago, I, I discovered this um, uh, uh, master's program in narrative medicine at the Columbia University here in New York. Narrative medicine, when I you know, read that, I was in awe. They're bringing health professionals and uh, English majors, writers, uh, you know, creative people together in the same program. And the idea is that uh, a healthcare provider, a doctor, nurse, whoever, or administrator uh, needs all of these other skills. They have to be very good at telling stories and intensely listening to stories because that's what we do. You know, we're, as a patient, we're telling a story. We're not really listening, you know. So these are the kinds of uh, uh, connected fields, interdisciplinary fields that I think um, sort of uh, should show us the way uh, of the 21st century. Uh, I love it. I, that's a that's a really healthy perspective, I think. S Sardar, what, what do you think uh, it is about art in your estimation that makes it such a great mechanism and conduit for crucial self and life exploration? Whenever I use art in the classroom, I get the most participation than I, that I've had in, in weeks. And is it, is it simply that everyone's view is valid and, and uh, you know, sussing out what a piece of art is about and there's no wrong answer? Well, that's, uh, I'm sure that's a part of it. That's a big part of it. Uh, I think, uh, you know, art is really recognizing that uh, the space of the imagination, right? And imagination is, I think, the safest space that we have. So in there, right, we can think not only for ourselves, but also by our own rules. Uh, at least that's how it was for me. So I'm 18, I'm in this world, you know, there are all these systems and expectations around me, right? Political, economic, you know, religious, social, etc. And I haven't created any of them. Mm -hmm. Yet I'm constricted by them. Yes, there are some great things that they offer. But at the same time, there are, you know, terrible, uh, you know, uh, restrictions and, and so forth. So naturally, you know, I'll be frustrated as an 18, 20 year old, that's a good healthy thing. And then I will try to do something about it, right? Find my way through it. But as I'm doing that, I'm still thinking in terms of the existing rules uh, or the rules and, you know, expectations of the existing systems. But you can go to your imagination, you know, and safely, create from scratch, create the kind of world you want to live in, create the kind of person you want to be. And it's safe to do that. Uh, and I think if, you know, once we can see that, that that's that space, and it's like you said, it, you know, the safety I think comes from definitely the, the moderator, the professor, the person mm -hmm. who facilitating, uh, because you can turn that into a very restrictive, <laughs> you know, experience too. But uh, obviously you're, you're good at it. You let your students feel that uh, security and safety in that space. Uh, and, and then, uh, you know, as we're, uh, as we're doing that, uh, we become aware of our capacities, you know, intellectual capacity and emotional instinctive capacities. So, uh, and find our own way of doing things. One quick question, since I mentioned that writing course, for instance, uh, when I decided I'm a bad writer, 
I, I felt, you know, if I sit down to write, there's the grammar, the syntax, the, you know, the punctuation and all of that. Uh, so there are rules, they're necessary, but it's a system. And for me, a text is already, you know, one step removed from the audience. So getting so frustrated about writing or in writing, because I still have to write, you know, my lectures or, or, or classes or, you know, talks or whatever, I had to produce texts. Um, I, you know, started thinking, so what, what's my point? My point is to connect, connect with whoever I'm, you know, trying to address, right? Uh, make that, and how do I make that connection? Well, when we talk, all of us are making that connection naturally because we bring our tone of voice, you know, the, the music mm -hmm. of, our, of our speech, our body language, our facial expressions, all of that to bear. And we're not really concerned about rules. It's kind of an informal, direct way of communicating. So I started, you know, talking to my, <laughs> talking to myself. I'll, you know, stand up and speak. Mm -hmm. Not really talking to myself, but, you know, speaking to someone, an audience. And if I thought that what I have is now uh, a good way to make a connection, then I will jot it down, you know, I'll, I'll write it down. And then the, the rest, the editing, my wife uh, takes care of that. I, I give her a sheet of paper and it comes back in a completely different color. Uh, you know, the black and white is now black and red and, and white all over. Uh, so, but this kind of thing, you know, there are millions of examples that we all have um, experienced of finding our own way uh, creating our own rules mm -hmm. that, you know, safe space of, of the imagination. Perhaps that's, you know, uh, also a, a big part of it. Yeah, this, uh, speaking of Renaissance, I find your approach uh, with oratory Shakespearean in nature, uh, uh, practicing out loud. And also, I mean, it's, it's, it's well noted that uh, Renaissance poets in, in England would write about the reason they loved writing poetry is because it allowed them to create their own worlds. They were planet makers as it were mm. in, in their own systems. And that's, I had never really thought about that exactly as creating a safe space for yourself, but that's exactly what it is, isn't it? It is, yeah. Uh, and, you know, that kind of creativity, so there are, you know, different uh, aspects of creative thinking, you know, or, or being in our imagination, part of it is uh, practical, mm -hmm. we, we find practical solutions to problems that otherwise, uh, you know, we're confounded with, or just creativity, sort of limitless, boundless self-expression, or, uh, you know, trying to understand our existence, you know, what are we doing here, what is existence, that kind of thing. But uh, there was a study, and I'm sure you're aware of it, uh, in 2010, uh, there, a study in, in Newsweek was uh, published, a long, you know, uh, ongoing study that showed that American creativity, which they were able to measure over, you know, decades, uh, and it was a global uh, research project also, uh, tra tracking, you know, year after year. American creativity for the first time in 2010 was on the decline. Whereas in the rest of the world, it was, you know, incrementally going up. Uh, the American system of education, which was so uh, admirable, uh, you know, so copied uh, in the rest of the world, the liberal arts, etc. Uh, in China, for instance, you know, Chinese educators, uh, part of that article, were looking at, you know, this, uh, this issue of, you know, creativity scores, etc. And how the US could, you know, be on the decline. Uh, and when they were introduced to the at that time, current American public education system, they, they were uh, sort of amused. They said, you know, we are doing now what American education was in the 60s, <laughs> and Americans are doing now what our education system was um, in the uh, 60s. So uh, yeah, that creativity, I mean, any score, right? IQ score, creativity score, it's, it's not 
it's imperfect, of course, sure. there are biases in there, but uh, it is important uh, as a trend. Uh, we, we have to notice it. The creativity is going down. There are practical uh, pitfalls that are going to follow, not just arts, you know. Uh, Absolutely. Absolutely. Sir, I'd, I'd like to ask you uh, a question about, about your life as an artist, if I may. Well, what's the creative process like for you? What, what inspires you? How, how do you begin to create when you've got a project in mind? Uh, uh, you, you know, that's, uh, it's about ideas and the process, I think. Mm -hmm. So uh, when I was younger, I would spend most of my time in the studio, just, you know, looking at what I've done the day before. I'd walk into the studio with great enthusiasm and yet here are these paintings and whatever that I've been working on. I made them, I know, but I'm at a point where I don't know how to proceed. And years later, I figured it out as uh, not as you know, lack of inspiration, uh, but as not being able to catch up to your own work. Mm -hmm. uh, because if you are able to create something new, you know, if it's new to you as well, right, then what you've created is, uh, is an unknown to you too. So, you know, when an artist creates, I don't know, a painting, a sculpture, it's not just one image, another image, you know, one painting, uh, one it's really a, a world or a universe in and of itself, right? Uh, it has its own language, has its own rationale, own logic. Its own geography. Yeah. Absolutely. And you are a foreigner to that geography yourself because it's new. So you do something, somehow the process allows you to get stuff out there on, on canvas, let's say, but then you need to understand <laughs> what you just did <laughs> so that your work can proceed in a consistent, meaningful uh, manner. Uh, when I was younger, I had ideas. I had, you know, envelopes full of, you know, little slips of paper with ideas, a drawer. I do that paper. too, yeah. Right. I would pull them out and I would try to then uh, imagine the final product somehow, the painting, the drawing, the whatever. But, uh, you know, over time, ideas, because ideas themselves don't create art, right? They're necessary. Ideas are necessary for art, uh, for music, you know, all kinds of creative work, but uh, art comes from somewhere else. And so process replaced coming up with ideas, I think. Ideas are just a part of the process. What happens with the process is, we, I mean, I walk into the studio and it's like tricking myself or my intellect into believing that it's, it's in charge, you know, it's running the show. Uh, the intellect is a bit of a bully because we rely too much on it uh, and, and we, the intellect wants to think that it's running the show, but it's only partially running the show. There are emotional, instinctive, subconscious stuff that we don't even know about. And I believe much of art uh, comes from there, you know, what we don't know. So the process, even something mundane as, you know, like clean your brushes or, or whatever, or just, you know, sand the surface or something like that, subdues the into you know leaves the outside world outside and it's mm -hmm. used the intellect just enough so that you know your other capacities your emotional instinctive whatever capacities could have a chance so if you can manage that and then you lose yourself in the process really sort of you know don't you know restrict yourself don't try to create and edit at the same time, right? You just pour it out and stuff comes out. Hopefully, uh, the next day you can look at it and begin to understand and maybe then edit, you know, as a, as a separate process. It uh, makes so me think of, of what Tolstoy said and what is art, uh, that, that once you identify something as art, it's all it's all over then at that point. Uh, you've already had <laughs> right. the experience, right. 
right uh, and 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 uh we're you're talking about tapping into those other sensibilities beyond the intellect i don't know why they work but they do work obviously well uh so one of my you know uh, recent uh, interests is brain science, neurology. I mean, as, as maybe most of us are, because it's so new, we're getting snippets of stuff about how the mind works. And what's so fascinating is that we think that our minds, our intellects are, are in charge and we are making rational decisions. But research is showing that <laughs> before the intellect even, you know, becomes active, another part of the, the emotional centers of the brain have already made the decision like a sprinter, for instance, you know, before the intellect, say, the mind says, okay, you heard the gunshot, go. Another part of the brain, the emotional part of the brain has already you know, sent the message <laughs> to the uh, muscles and they're already beginning to move. So the, the mind is catching up to itself sort of. So, and there are so many examples of this. Uh, I, I mean, uh, Jonah Lehrer, I think, uh, a Colombian neuroscientist, he, he wrote in an article saying, feeling our way to decision-making that decisions are not um, made solely, you know, rationally, but they are underpinned by emotions, by our emotional capacity. So it's, yeah, it's, it's very important to, I think, uh, balance, balance the two. It's, uh, it's fascinating. I don't understand half of it, but uh, it's, it's really a, a, a fascinating <laughs> yeah, phenomenon. Yeah. Uh, now, uh, I, I imagine that it must be really gratifying for you, Sardar, the, the variety of work uh, that, that, you, that you've been able to do as an artist, an educator, uh, a curator. Uh, and we talk about how important uh, campus art galleries, for instance, are to the, the, uh, just the, the, the health of, of, of a college or university. We have a good one here at UNL. Uh, on the shelf, we've got uh, Hopper, Bierstadt, uh, Rothko pieces that we take for granted. Uh, th that, 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 but it must be gratifying for you, that combination of work that you've been able to do. What, do you feel like the, the, if you were solely an artist, that the commercial pressure uh, would be uh, uh, hard to, to, to manage, tolerable? Uh, well, I, I think different parts of your question, right? First, mm -hmm. uh, the ability, uh, the chance to, to do different things, you know, run the gallery, teach, be an artist, lecture, etc. Mm -hmm. uh, they've been unexpectedly, for me, unexpectedly and, and um, immeasurably uh, gratifying. Uh, probably because they feed one another, like you said, they mm -hmm. actually mm -hmm. support and feed one another. So, uh, that's yeah. I've been very fortunate with that. Which, which normally, you know, in my youth, I would have seen as no. I'm an artist. You know, I want to do art. I don't want to do this, that, and the other. Right? That that will be my because they're competing for my time. Uh, art and commerce is uh, it's so important because uh, there's no way around the uh, the market economy, or at least uh, we can say exchange economy. Even if you step outside of the capitalist system, still you're you know some kind of exchange, right? Right. You so, have to live. Uh, exactly, uh, and, and you have to do something with your work, with your artwork. If you're an artist, you're producing that. What do you do with it? Um, I, just instinctively, I decided early on that if I relied on uh, selling my work. Uh, to pay the rent and you know to survive, uh, it, that would be a disaster. That um, at at best, even if I were successful in making a living that way, uh, it, it would commercialize my work. In other words, the content, the subject, would be commercial because it's very easy to. Uh, convince ourselves that we're we're on the right track, you know, or 
that, well, you know, I can do this uh, and then I can do that. Uh, that those comp it's a very slippery uh, slope, you know. Um, so to stay away from that, I decided I'll have a day job, you know, mm -hmm. and I was, I was fortunate enough that uh, teaching and then, you know, like you said, lecturing, uh, you know, running the gallery, et cetera, they were, they became uh, my, my day jobs, which was uh, uh, terrific for me. So that's, that's, you know, uh, that's the balance I find. Am I comfortable with the commercial aspect of it? No, it's extremely uncomfortable. So again, in, uh, you know, pragmatically, what I do is, you know, sell some of my work, uh, gift some of it, and even exchanged uh, some of it, you know, in like we had a doctor, for instance, when my wife was pregnant, who was an art lover, and I gave him a suite of lithographs, and he was more than happy to, you know, take that as, as part of the payment, etc. Uh, but, uh, and there is that great book, I'm sure you know, The Gift. Mm, yes, yeah, uh, Lewis Hyde. Lewis Hyde, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. And I was just reading his, the, the new edition, 2007 edition, and he had a, uh, uh, a section there, uh, sort of uh, an afterword to the book, where he was arguing uh, that initially, you know, suggesting that art is a, a gift, just the concept of art, you know, where we get it is a, is a gift. And then, you know, we should give it back as a gift, which is true, but that his insistence on that was probably not, uh, was probably a bit naive. Mm -hmm. He now came to the conclusion that it should be a mixture of the two. Yes, an artist can sell, should sell part of the work, and then the money, uh, the financial gain goes back into mm -hmm. or surviving as an artist. You know, you're not doing it to get rich and wealthy and, and whatever. Right. Uh, it's not that. Uh, so if that helps, you know, sure, sell the market works for that purpose, but it's also uh, possible to gift the work. Uh, uh, so that sort of I, I've been doing that without <laughs> without knowing uh, for for decades, uh, mm -hmm. decades now. It's uh, uh, it, I, I wasn't going down a wild goose chase then when I, uh, I, I I mentioned to you earlier in our correspondence your your mentor Angelo Apolito right. uh, his son John Apolito has this seminal essay why art should be free that I used to teach as an English instructor. And uh, are you sympathetic to that essay? Do you, are you aware of it and feel yeah. similarly? He, yeah. he mentions Lewis Hyde quite a Absolutely. lot. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and uh, you know, first of all, every time, uh, you know, Angelo Ippolito uh, comes into any conversation is a very special, uh, you know, moment for me. So thanks for that chance. Not at all. Uh, uh, I say Angelo first. He's, you know, John's father. Because he, um, you know, he taught me, I think, by example, uh, the concept of the gift, you know, uh, the gift of art and also of the self. You know, he gifted me uh, his <laughs> generosity of spirit. Uh, and, and I was so humbled by it. And I would keep saying, you know, you're doing so much for me and I can't return any of it. And he sort of scolded me one day, you know, uh, he said, uh, well, stop it. Of course you can't. Uh, he said, other people did that for me. They're not around, so I can't return the favor. I do it for you. You'll do it for others. And that was an eye opening for me, you know, um, just that he could put it that way, comforted me. OK, so my job is not to you know, give back to him but to go forward to pass it on. Yeah, absolutely. And that's, yeah. that's the gift. And John, uh, his essay also concludes, uh, you know, he makes an exhaustive argument. I mean, it's, it's a wonderful essay, I think, but he also comes to the conclusion that it should be a combination of, of that's right. both, uh, in I mean, uh, inescapably. 
Uh, because mm -hmm. it is always an exchange, some kind of exchange, and money is not going, you know, anywhere. This is so partially selling the work, and then partially gifting it, um, and things like images or or copyrights. Mm -hmm. I'm I'm all in favor of, of course, uh, that kind of openness. You know, the pitfalls, of course, are obvious. You know, if I'm open, if you're open to putting your work out there. And if someone else uh, benefits from that openness by taking it and commercializing it, right? Then mm -hmm. it's uh, then it's something where we need to you know to think about or, or protect against. I think, yeah. Right, Serdar, I, I characterized your uh, working in the gallery, teaching, also being an artist as a as a positive, which of course it is, but in the day to day, uh, doing all of those things and, and uh, trying to make it all work is difficult, right? You wrote in your article for the, for the New York Times in 2001 in your article, Vacation mm. and the Creative Process, the demands placed on your time between your, your work, your job and, and family. Uh, it reminds me of a couple of things. We're here in Nebraska and we celebrate former U.S. Poet Laureate Ted Kuzer, but he used to write about uh, how he wrote his poetry uh, at his job at the insurance company. And there, there are contemporary pop lyrics that I like that sing, right. I give my finest hours to administrative powers till the daylight <laughs> falls right. apart and I'm too tired to do my art. Uh, you must feel that way sometimes. Uh, you're exhausted, you get home, uh, but uh, you're, you're tired and you want to be creative. That's a challenge. Right. It is a challenge. It's uh, a very hard challenge when you're younger, at least in my experience it was. It got a lot easier as I, as I got older. But first of all, yeah, I have drawings, sketches, notes about my artwork on the pages of faculty uh, meeting <laughs> agendas. Uh, so the I do too. Yeah, deans and you know provosts are, are all you know underneath my drawings. So uh, yeah, you find ways. Uh, and then you know, I, I, every time I'm emptying the dishwasher, and, and this is honest, I'm not exaggerating, and sorting out the silverware, you know, day after day, I, that used to drive me crazy. Like what is you know like matching socks and then you know, it, it, but. Lately, uh, lately, meaning the last couple of decades, uh, I have a, almost a funny joy about it because as I'm getting to the end of that task, I'm getting closer to my studio time. So I'm, I'm giving myself a little treat, a little reward, um, like a good, you know, well-trained dog. Uh, so if, if I do this, I get my reward kind of thing. And, and that makes it all of a sudden uh much much more uh you know meaningful you do the task of course you want to uh, then go to your studio yeah it's the gateway to free time i get that entirely uh i i don't like washing dishes either and i play that same same game but whatever it takes right, right. Uh, i i want to i want to go to your 2006 ted talk uh on our memory and the value of personalized note-taking right. And in that presentation, you speak about the challenge of getting students to, to reach for that level of, of engagement that personalized note taking requires, even though the internet is out of the bag and the, the art slides that must be, must be memorized are no longer locked in the file cabinet. Your, uh, your, your presentation, your, your TED Talk is so good and inspired me to create a whole other workshop here myself on on that very topic on personalized note taking and i don't have a solution either so all i've done is is uh, compound the conundrum and we have a lot of students here that take uh history of jazz history of rock music courses and they need to, to take notes therein and so i what i do sardar is i bring in an old uh record player and I play 45 vinyl records three at a time and ask the students to make thematic connections or musical connections somehow bring these pieces together through their individualized uh, 
uh, personalized note taking. I'm probably my my asking them to write about music is probably asking them to dance about architecture. Uh, but I do. Uh, I, I don't under I don't really know how to draw out the engagement that we're talking about. We know that personalized note taking that builds on prior knowledge is great for creating meaning, forging those neural connections, but it's challenging to get students to take notes at all sometimes these days when the PowerPoint is available. What what are your thoughts on all of this? Yeah, yeah, that's a huge big thing. And and that TED talk uh, came out of uh, my frustration, basically. I could mm -hmm. see quite concretely, I could see student performance declining at a certain point on memory skills, just the mm -hmm. memory part of final exams. And I, I always kept the final exams, like so I had like 20 years worth of final exams and I finally uh, pulled them out and it took me about a semester to tally just the memory part of those exams. And certainly, you know, it goes uh, by semester, sort of up and down, up and down. And then at one point it drops and then starts coasting at that lower level. About 15 to 20% drop. Now, I, I can't suggest a causality here, obviously, but there's a very strong connection between uh, what must have happened at around that time when the drop happened, which, which was that the school and I in my classes switched to the Blackboard platform. Mm -hmm. And right. I was ecstatic when we did that because I thought, okay, now I can put all my slides, all the images, PowerPoint, everything there, 24 seven access to students. Isn't that what they've been waiting for? And uh, yes, it was terrific. They felt better about it, but their performance then dropped. Mm -hmm. So there is something about the ready-made, uh, consuming the ready-made. And in a way, our, um, not only our PowerPoints and stuff that are you know, available to students, so they don't have to write it down in class. Yeah. But even the photo, you know, I was thinking of photography. We're in such a visual age. Push of a button and we have a photograph, another button, and it goes to five friends, just like that. So even instead of writing a, a short text, I find myself sending a photograph, you know, mm -hmm. a chess set and a, and a drink, whatever. It's like my friend, you know, inviting me to come and play chess with me. So or emojis. Same exactly. Yeah. yeah. But the thing is, even though we're taking those photographs, they're not really personal because uh, it's just a you know button that that we're pushing. Too it's easy. A way of circulating or consuming uh, ready mates. Uh, so what happened before? Uh, the and uh, like you said, the genie is out of the bag. So we're not going to go back. You know, technology never. Uh, recedes right. forward, but uh, before the blackboard, students would panic in the classroom. I mean, I'd show them an artwork. Uh, professor, is this in the book? No, it's not. No, two thirds were not in the book. And uh, you could see the slight panic there. And panic is great in terms of motivation, right? It motivates you to be creative and, and find a solution. So they would sketch, doodle, make funny you know, notes, and also comments, even if they ask the, the most mundane question about it, you know, like what was the date again, or uh, whatever, anything about it, just because they asked or talked, uh, another part of the brain is involved. Yes. And then taking notes. So uh, it is extremely important, I think, in terms of memory skills and one of the comments to that ted talk was i, I was saying there uh, that i was surprised by how students now right did not you know retain and somebody said well duh you know it's they don't need to anymore and it, it made me think that uh you know unless we have some informational knowledge up here 
we can't even form a sentence, you know, let alone a complete thought. So, no, it is necessary for us to mm. know uh, some basic factual information so that, you know, we can't construct a sentence by constantly Googling, you know, every word or, or every knowledge. So, uh, yes, it's a very important thing. And I'm, I'm now curious about your methods, actually, of, of doing that. But if you're able to make students and it doesn't have to be note taking. It's like, uh, a di you know, it could be called something else, a diary or, or mm -hmm. what, you know, a sketch pad, you know. Just Absolutely. Motor skill is involved, I think, is, is very important. Yeah. And in some ways, it's intrinsically impossible to define because if you're, it's the sort of thing that if you're doing it right, it's right. so personalized that the person next to you doesn't even recognize what it is to begin with. <laughs> exactly. Uh, Sardar, take us figuratively, figuratively, if you will, into your library. Uh, mm. what, what are your own artistic tastes in, in reading, music, art, film? And do you read more fiction or nonfiction? Do you have uh, desert island books or albums that you consider? Oh. <laughs> at Desert Island, yes. Um, so if, if you know, Desert Island, of course, suggests, you know, narrowing it down really to like a, a this is my Bible kind of thing. Um, Joseph Campbell's the power, uh, the power of Myth. It is an amazing book. Uh, even when I think I've had enough of it, like I've read it 10 times or referred to, you know, every page is dog-eared and, and so forth. It is one that I would take with me because it's, it's, so it's about everything mm -hmm. uh, and it is also so suggestive so creative um uh, and and it's a marvelous mind at work so i think that would be uh right by my side but uh what i read is is a you know some fiction some non-fiction and the non-fiction uh i just read uh the shorter version uh, not the scientist version, but the public version of, um, it's called The Conscious Mind by Zoltan Torre. He, uh, uh, MIT Press published it. It's about consciousness, human consciousness, and how our consciousness evolved as opposed to uh, the animal world, you know, other creatures, uh, they have brains, they have split brains, you know, and, and so forth, but how ours developed into a kind of consciousness that it that can reflect on its own. Mm -hmm. In other words, as I'm having a thought, I'm also aware that I'm having a thought, right? And, and that is, uh, there is very complex research behind it, of course. So he does the favor of publishing, you know, a second sort of uh, second version for the public in, in general. And it's a it's an incredible book. I would recommend it with uh, great great you know uh, passion. Uh, and then there are other books. Yeah, I read a lot of uh, fiction or. Mm -hmm semi-fiction like behind the beautiful forevers i have it right in front of me here catherine boo uh, a journalist who wrote about uh, mumbai india the mm -hmm. uh, the really you know uh, the the lowest rung uh, economically of people who were making a living she lived with them for months and went back several times so it is a uh, documenting life but it reads like fiction because she mm. empathizes with them and and this it's incredible uh it's it's real and also uh very moving uh so there are other like there's a book uh i don't know the, the date of it uh now uh noonday demon an atlas of depression by andrew solomon who himself suffered from depression. Uh, and that it's a very thick book, but incredible, probably because also, I mean, there's there's some history uh, in, in my family, my you know, father, et cetera. Uh, and, and also it's one of those mysteries, you know, depression has only recently been a, a little better understood or, mm -hmm. or studied. So this is an incredible book of, you know, 
personal accounts and and how one you know deals with it as well as all of the science and and alternatives available so yeah my my books are are sort of there's a wide range um uh, that's important across the across the spectrum uh you said music uh, yeah what are your tastes in music uh jazz i mean I, I my father was loved classical western music and and i i uh, you know sang in choirs for classical turkish music etc but jazz is i think you know for the desert island uh mm -hmm. pat metheny's uh off ramp okay um, that's coming with me i mean that's <laughs> going to be there and if if there's room you know miles davis would would be uh one astor piazzola pink floyd can always come and visit you know they're All right um, they're they're um uh, it's you know um when i was in junior high our downstairs neighbor in istanbul would come from work at around 5 30 on you know warm summer days open up the balcony doors blast this stereo uh dave brubeck's uh take five was still new and he had the lp he would put that that was the first thing and i mean the whole neighborhood you know the bass from downstairs would be uh <laughs> pounding and day after day i listened to it and i just loved it uh that was i think my first introduction to to jazz um uh thanks to thanks to our neighbor. that's a good one yeah sardar what would you say is is the best and most challenging part as well of living in new york new york well um first of all i live in this suburb of of new york so it's a 40 mm -hmm. minute you know drive or commuter train to manhattan i had a studio in manhattan for some years in the 90s shared with a musician friend uh i mean the comparative experience in new york is i think unequaled anywhere so you know you can go to the met the metropolitan museum and experience ancient indian art and now you can just walk across the street a few blocks down Asia uh, society and see contemporary Indian artists, for instance, in the course of a, you know, uh, an afternoon. Uh, that kind of cultural wealth, creative, you know, uh, wealth is, uh, you know, at any given point from 400 to 500 galleries and museums only in Manhattan, right? And it came down to about 400 only in the uh, the Great Recession of 2008 and, and nine, and then bounced back up. That's an unbelievable, in, incomparable number. So um, that said, of course, Manhattan, like most um, cities, uh, large cities, uh, is very expensive. So the studio I had, I had almost no light. Uh, it was a fifth floor walk up with large paintings, uh, noise, crowds, et cetera, as any city would. Uh, but another thing about Manhattan is that the city itself, what it offers, the wonderful you know, stuff that it offers is exhausting. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember as graduate students, we would take the van from the college, drive to the city from Albany, uh, go to galleries, et cetera, really terrific experience, have cheap Indian food and drive back. My friends would immediately that night go into their studios to, you know, with that excitement to create. Uh, I would need a couple of days just you know subdue all of that so i could hear my my own thoughts to go back into the studio so that's one thing uh that happens with new york one needs to experience it but then i think put it into uh perspective uh, right my late brother tom uh worked at art galleries uh on the mm -hmm. lower east side in the 80s ah. in new york as well oh, but, yeah. yeah that was an exciting time yeah yes yes uh, Senator, what's I'd like to ask you as we close, uh, what projects are you currently working on? What what lies ahead for you artistically? 
Oh, uh, currently I'm uh, sort of recovering from uh, the latest work. Uh, it's a huge installation, uh, lights, sculpture, etc. Uh, I never thought I would do something like that. I never thought I would do sculpture, and it, it is in fact sculptural, and it took uh, many years. So uh, there is that sort of exhaustion a little bit yes i'm trying to understand that and also logistically there's so many problems uh you know when you do something like that logistically you know how do you package ship it create it show it etc there's a film a project that's in the works a dear friend of mine is working to produce a film about it so maybe it'll be more accessible wow. I'm trying to exhibit that takes a, a lot of time and of course work you know my my painting is is still continuing although i'm doing fewer pieces quantity wise i'm you know feeling comfortable to sort of turn it down a little focus more on each piece Mm -hmm. And the older I get, the more um, destruction uh, of work I do uh, or editing, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, right. Well, I, I, one question I must close with, uh, as, sure. as I said, I, I would. Uh, Sardar, what do you recall about Lori uh, from your time together oh. at Concordia? I know she took the trip to Turkey with you as well. She did. I mean, that that might just sum it up right there. Uh, Lori and I uh, reconnected last summer. Actually, she was good enough to uh, call me up, and we, you know, sat down and had coffee, and actually talked after so many years. And uh, you know, apart from my you know impression of of her as a student, which I'll come back to, I I realized how little of her background and of her life I knew when she was a student. And there was something, you know, something sad about that. And I thought of her and other students, so many other students, that you're, you know, because of time constraints and other pressures, we're missing mm -hmm. uh, so much of that personal contact. And I think the person, both for, you know, for, from my perspective, both for professors to know more about the person mm -hmm. in front of the mm -hmm. student, and for the student to know the professors and other professionals who are available as persons. Yes. It always comes down to the, the person. You know, I've, I've, I don't remember the content of my courses, really. Uh, maybe just a snippet here and there, but I do remember uh, individuals, a few professors here and there, and a few really good artists who made all the difference for me. Right, so uh, I think that's key to experience in in uh, in college. But Laurie had, you know, steady uh, resilience right? with some people. Uh, you can sort of sense that they have this inner strength. Mm -hmm. uh, she wasn't loud and all over the place at all. And that, that you know, that's a special kind of strength. You know, she knows where she's going and she'll get there. You know, she has that. And then the, you know, the fact that from Nebraska to New York, when I understand her family was not really sort of uh, crazy about the idea for college. She made that, she made that happen. And she made that herself, found ways of making it happen. And then her curiosity, she, like you mentioned, came on that trip to Turkey. Uh, and many of our students at Concordia would be squeamish about going to Manhattan from the college, you know, and, and Lori uh, did that. And I think she really uh, got the most out of uh, what Concordia College offered. You know, she got that- No question. That education. So she's a very, very dear person. Uh, and, and, you know, you can just look at her, your, her face, her eyes, the curiosity and the, the fire in there, right? You, you, you know. Uh, yeah, I'm very glad that she connected and and then uh, you know invited me. Uh, and here we are. Yeah. yeah.
Absolutely. Sardar, I've heard so much about you uh, over the last several years, and it's just a, a real pleasure to, to finally meet with you and get a chance to, to speak with you a little bit. Uh, I, uh, we'd like to thank you. Uh, we're very grateful for your time, and I look forward to future uh, lectures of yours as well that I'll uh, hopefully be able to attend. But many, many thanks for joining us here today. It's truly it's a personal honor for me. Thank you uh, so much, uh, Dan, uh, to you and also to Lori. I'm really grateful for this uh, for this chance and all the best to our students and, and the rest of our audience out there. Thank you. Thank you very much.